Welcome to Strength in the Numbers. My name is Andrew Codd, accountant, author, and commercial finance entrepreneur. And it's my job each week to bring you leaders in finance and business and deconstruct with them their real stories, insights, and hard-won lessons into practical advice on the key strengths and qualities you need to remain relevant in accounting and finance today, as well as the steps you can begin to take to elevate the impact you make to have a fun, successful, and rewarding career in accounting and finance. Now let's go over to the show. Hi everyone and welcome to this week's episode of Strength in the Numbers. Now some of our audience have reached out to me expressing a bit of fear, concern, but also talking optimistically about the future of our profession. But, you know, either way we look at it, there's still a lot of challenges, issues and things for us to work through. So given there's no escaping this rapid rate of change, the digitization, globalization of our profession, as well as the businesses and societies we serve and work in, then how can we figure out how best to make a genuine impact for all our stakeholders, as well as have meaningful and prosperous careers in finance and accounting? Well, what better way to find out than ask Andrew Harding, Chief Executive Management Accounting at the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants, which represents 667,000 members and students covering public practice and management accounting, and whose purpose is to advocate for the public interest and business sustainability on current emerging issues, these are just some of the topics Andrew and I covered in today's episode. But we've also talked about how we keep ahead of the rapid pace of change and how we must question what's relevant today to have a sustainable career. We discussed the importance of successful businesses and our role in addressing the trust deficit in society. And finally, the advantage of becoming known as a value creator for not only shareholders, but also stakeholders. And look, don't forget to mention us to your friends and your colleagues if you think that they would find some of what we discuss useful and relevant for them as they figure out their way to have a prosperous career in finance and accounting and also help make a more genuine impact for the organisations they serve. So look, that's enough for me. So without further ado, over to Andrew and the show. Andrew, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Great to be with you. Thanks, Andrew. Now, look, you've done a, you do a lot of traveling and we've had a chance to meet on a couple of occasions previously. But for some of our audience who may be not as familiar with your story or your background, do you mind sharing with us a bit your journey in accounting and finance, please? Yeah, sure. It's been it's been quite a long journey, as I'm sure you can imagine. I, I, I started off, I graduated in 1983. Um, Started off, started off as a started off as a trainee as a trainee auditor, I guess, and I guess sort of probably about a year into that, I started to think, hold on a minute, this isn't what I this isn't quite what I thought it was going to be. I, yeah, what I wanted to what I wanted to do was to be finding solutions, driving you know helping drive successful successful businesses and things like that, and it didn't it didn't really feel feel like that to me. Having said that, you know I enjoyed working in the environment. I I like the accounting. I like the accounting profession. I like the people in it, and I kind of moved into the people side of the work. So I started working in training and development, recruitment, those those sorts of areas. Still with still within the still within the profession, um, and. That that really did sort of feed my feed my sort of passion and interest, which was very much around around people, education, how we improve things, how we make how we make things how we make things better. Um, you know, I moved into professional bodywork in the early 1990s, um, and at that point, I, I joined ACCA. Um, so that was my first move into a professional body, and that was that was all about implement, implementing. The 1989 Companies Act, bringing in regulation around training, all sorts of other things, and I like I like to think what I what I did there was implement regulation in a way that in a way that developed people, in a way that helped help helped firms, helped businesses to develop better better results. Um, so that was really my sort of first move into professional body work. I did all kinds of I did all kinds of roles at ACCA. Um, Finally, finally, sort of managing director, looking after all of their global markets, and I moved to I moved to SEMA almost ten years ago, beginning of two thousand and nine, where I was originally the global markets director. I then became managing director, and then 
in the summer of 2016, I was SEMA's, SEMA's final chief executive for six months up until the creation of the new association at the beginning of 2017. So that's, that's roughly my roughly my route. But for me, you know, it has always, you know, what drives me, what gets me up in the morning has always been, you know, how do we, how do we improve people's careers? How do we, how do we develop people? That's my, you know, that's my, that's my passion. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, um, I, I want to touch on your passion, but also I don't want to miss the fact that I think your experience in accounting and finance is probably as long as I've been on this planet. So that's quite impressive. <laughs> Andrew. So, so, so yeah, um, yeah, there's so much there, but I guess in terms of that journey, let's even pick what the, 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 the professional bodies and associations you've been involved with and leading. I mean, things must've changed dramatically during that time, right? I mean, like, how do you get a sense of to, to, I suppose, ride the wave of change, but also make, make it benefit the members of those organizations? I mean, so much must have happened and changed in that time. Oh, well, let, let me just, I mean, just the, the most simple thing about the change that's happened in those times, the most dramatic way I can tell you about that is, in 1991, in the ACCA office at that point, I think there were 15 of us sharing one PC. I, I, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we all have a portable hard drive we could slot into it and use on that if we if we needed it and that was that was the world in those days and then suddenly That's overnight we all got a machine on our desks um and you know nobody 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 talks about internet in those days you know internet we started talking about mid to late mid to late 90s so huge transformation the big so the biggest change is digitization the speed at which things happen and i guess, I guess the other thing is you know the way the way in which the world the way in which the world has changed um you know economies that we and business centers we would have classified as developing are now are now leading and we've seen people we've seen organizations make huge huge jumps because of the technology that's available and also also because of the way in which yeah the way in which cost has dropped and the way in which people have an education has become 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 better across the world. I think I think if all of us look back thirty years, we'd be we'd be absolutely staggered at how much how much the world has changed. In particular, you know how much better our lives are. Yeah, I, it does feel that there's a lot better access to opportunity. I, but but like you know when you started saying there, I was just writing some notes down. The speed of change, digitization. Um, developing economies now becoming more uh, developed and leading you know that that's been the story our, our profession has seen all that happen I'm just thinking all the way back to um, to much earlier times there's always been change the speed of it may have got faster the digitization is probably one of the newer strands uh, from an industrial revolution perspective is there is it possible to get ahead of those things or is it just possible to try and ride them best we can I mean what's the best approach oh yeah, you know, I think I think there there are things where you there are things where you can you can get ahead, um, but you know once once you're ahead, you're only yeah you know, you're only ahead for a period of months. You have to keep that you have to keep that that rapid that rapid change going. You know when I think about when I think about our curriculum, that sort of thing, and we we get oh well we revise we used to, we used to get well we revise it every four to five years and we keep it relevant. <laughs> And, you know what is what is relevant today that was relevant in 2013. Yeah, you know, we have to we have to start to question that. That that sort of cycle is no longer valid. If I think about the things that if I think about the things that I learned, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, as a as a trainee from 1983 to 1986, <laughs> what did I learn then that's relevant now? Well, you know, all of the statute has changed, all the tax has changed. Yes, a lot of them. A lot of the you know, techniques have changed. What hasn't changed, though, is that primarily you're working with people and you have to get things done. You have to influence people. You have to get the right decisions made. That's all, that's all still there. So that becomes the really key sustainable part of it, which lasts forever. But other pieces, yeah, you've got to move. You've got to change. Um, you know, we need, to, we need to look at the world. We need to anticipate the world. When we look at it, we see... We see organizations at all different stages of development and change. Yeah. You know, we can say, yeah, we can see some who are still still operating as they did 10 years ago. They often talk about needing to make a leapfrog. 
yeah, that means that they've recognized how far behind they are. We see some actually, you know, at the real bleeding edge and they will, they will make mistakes, but they they have a culture mm -hmm. which allows them to do that and allows them to sort of take that, you know, take a technology, take a, take a punt on technology. And if it doesn't work, you know, that doesn't matter. And, you know, we'll see, there's so many times we see, you know, what's the, what's the latest big thing on technology? Some of them just fade away and disappear. And do you remember Google 3D glasses and all of those yeah, sorts of things? Briefly, yes, yes, Google Glass, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, Google Glass. Oh, that's you know, come and gone. That was going to be yeah. the fantastic thing. So we, you know, when we see things come, some of them are adopted, some of them aren't. Um, some companies choose to be at different, you know, adopt at different stages. And I think you know, we have to sort of ride that. Yeah, it's like the thing is, it's like knowing what to to back and what not to, and and I suppose keeping the the syllabus uh, as you you touched on there is keeping that relevant. I suppose, you know, looking out there at the moment, Andrew, your broad visibility. I mean, what are the best things we can be doing to stay relevant? I think you touched on some of them, but as accounting and finance professional, what's the best things we can be doing to stay relevant? Yeah, I, I, to stay relevant is all about the value that you create in the business. And, you know, it's no, lo it's no longer good enough to turn up at nine, move the numbers around, go home at five and say, and say you know, my contribution is producing this report. Yes. Now, what, yes. now what you have to be doing is anything you produce, what's the result of that? What does that create? Whose mind does it change? Whose thinking does it change? How does it impact on the business? And... You know, some of, the, some of the leading companies that we talked to, I, I was with a finance business partner this last week at a leading IT business. And he says, I don't have finance in my job title anymore. I'm assessed on the impact that I create with the data I have at my fingertips. I no longer do the analysis. We've automated that. It's all about how embedded I am in the business, how I understand the business. And he says, now I don't have to seek permission to be in a meeting. Now people look to me for the solutions. He said it's very, very different from where finance was five years ago, where you were regarded as the back office. Now you are the owner of the understanding of the business. People want to know if they pull a lever here, what's the impact here? Yes. And I'm that, I'm that guide to them. And I create solutions. I also help them develop their own solutions. So a very, 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 very different role. But you can see how yeah. this feeling of, influence and impact really becomes important and that stuff can't be automated yeah yeah it's like the more the more finest professional to work with i think insight we're, we're generally good on it's that influence and impact maybe it's a stereotype i mean look I, I also did a stint in practice and i suppose we were caught a lot behind our desks and that and but like i mean that's got to be quite a big change i suppose you're going from technical hard skills i mean you know when you're sort of saying about the uh, um, regulation and the, the Companies Act earlier, Andrew, back in back in the eighties. Yeah. Going forward now to developing professionals that have influence and impact. I mean, how how do you how do you adjust for that? I mean, I mean that's quite a big change. I mean, how do you also get people to see that and people to develop? Otherwise, they'll get left behind. Yeah, well, that's yeah that that is a that is a real challenge. Um, you know, the there are there are a number of finance roles which. If I'm going to be honest, they involve moving data from one system to another <laughs> on a spreadsheet. That is stuff which is ripe for automation. You know, the business advisory sections of the consulting firms, that's their bread and butter. They eliminate that. Those roles disappear. And, you know, cost, cost is just eliminated as well. And people doing those roles, they need to be, they need to be adapting their skills. They need to be moving into that into that business partnering role. You know, when we talk, when we talk to corporates, you know, those that have made these big changes, a lot, most of them have not, to date, have not been eliminating huge numbers of jobs. What they've been doing is creating new roles. So the roles which would have been back office suddenly become business partnering roles because the front line of the business, again, is experiencing this huge, rapid change in speed. That means they need information, they need data at their fingertips. They don't have time to wait, they don't have time for analysis to be done, and they need that business partner who is yeah. embedded and has that deep understanding. And that's, you know, that's the shift that has to be made. 
And you know, the challenge to the challenge to a mid-career professional who's been moving data around is really, you know, you've been moving that data around. That's given you an understanding of the business. Get out into yes. the business, start using that understanding. And that's that's what it's that's what it's all about. You know, sometimes we get people, you know, you I talk to people that have done those those jobs and they say, I felt like a robot. Well, you know, the great news is a robot will do that. And you can now do the yeah. stuff you want to do and you can add that yeah. value. So that's the yeah, you know, that's the way we that's the way we see it going. But there is a, there, you know, there is a hard message in there, which is mm. we have to, we have to adapt, we have to move, we have to change, and we have to recognise the world is changing, and no one is going to turn the clock back for us. Yeah, no, the clock the clock is definitely not going to be turned back, definitely. And um, but but that said, like I like the way you described that, Andrew, because um, if you do feel like a robot, that's a very good signal. But also, I think that's quite valuable for an organisation in a way that well, automate your own job. Um, some someone asked recently when I mentioned that we were interviewing. They said, "How do you become more secure as an accounting or finance professional? How do you improve job security or career security so you know we can keep um, adding value and developing into the future and be around in the future?" Do you have any thoughts on that in terms of how we can sort of, I suppose, remain relevant or improve the job security yeah. in our in our profession? Yeah, well, I think I mean you hinted at it there. I mean, for me, it is you know become a master of the machine. If you feel like a robot, the chances yeah. are, you know, your job could be, or that role, those things, those things that make you feel like a robot can be automated. And why don't you do that yourself? You know, and this is, it's a mindset thing. We see the young people we see coming into the profession now automatically do that. We had a, we had someone in doing an internship with us for about six weeks, doing some research work for us two years ago. And he then, he was doing a four year sandwich degree. So he had a year in business. He was working for one of the London banks. And he came in to talk to us about what he'd been doing. And he was saying, oh, you know, I used to spend all morning producing a daily report, but it had to be out by midday. And it's, you know, that was what I spent the morning doing. He said, I hated it. He said, so, you know, he said, my, my report to the university in my year is about automating processes in the bank. I just said, what do you know about that? You know, you, you, you're doing an econom economics degree. And he said, well, he said, that report, he said, I wrote a program to automate it. He said, now I come in, I log in at 8.30, I go and make myself a cup of tea and I come back to my desk and the report is done and it's issued before nine o'clock. <laughs> I then have two hours to do something which is more interesting. And that is, you know, that's the mindset, that's the mindset that's coming in. And yeah, we, we, all need to be, we all need to be thinking about that stuff. It's not, it, it, it's, it's different thinking. But some of it, some of it isn't as, isn't as different as you might think. If we talk about analytics, talk to the talk to the business about the analytics it uses. It's the same stuff that people have been studying as sixteen-year-olds at, at school when they're doing maths, and they've been doing that stuff for thirty, forty years. You know, it's the it's the stuff which I studied at school. The difference is, rather than now doing it with four or five pieces of data and trying to plot a graph with a ruler, you do it with thousands and thousands of pieces of data and you get a much more accurate picture because it can be crunched automatically and faster and easier so we shouldn't be frightened of that this stuff is this stuff is making this these things easier for us I, I agree with you i don't think we should be be afraid and i think we probably gain greater security by by creating insecurity in, in our own jobs so that they become more obsolete yeah let's let i mean let's think if we go back to you know what is relevance what are people looking for the from you in your job they're looking at the value you create and that's you know that brings us to you know if you can build a process in yeah automate a process that creates that creates value for the business you then become known as a value creator yes and your personal reputation your personal skills base is around creating value rather than you know rather than crunching a report that adds value to you in the business and that starts to take you from that position where you know you're doing analysis to that position where you're influencing and having impact and that's where the that's where the value is so yeah i mean i wouldn't look at it as making making your own job obsolete i would look at it yeah. as reinventing that job creating time so that 
you add you add value in other in other areas. Excellent. Yeah, no, I, I like the way you you you've turned that round. I think reinventing is definitely a better way of looking at it. And I suppose you touched on earlier, like you know, there's some areas that they, you're particularly excited about. I suppose what's what's most exciting you about your current work, Andrew? Oh, for me, for me, a lot of it a lot of it is that transformation of the profession thing, because you know that's about changing the way changing the way we do things. Um, and yeah, so there, there's a whole piece there around future proofing the management accounting profession, ensuring not, insur- not just ensuring that we remain relevant for the careers of our members, but ensuring that our members are delivering best possible value to their businesses. So that their businesses are secure, prosperous, and sustainable in the long term. You know, there's a whole thing that we, you know, we sometimes forget. And that is the importance of successful business in our society. You know, successful businesses create jobs. They create prosperity. They, they, provide, they provide the tax take, which enables governments to provide services. We sometimes, we sometimes lose that in, when we look at the, when we look at the, ecosystem, when we look at the, you know, the ecosystem. And I think you know, what we need to be thinking about is you know, we, prosperous careers, successful businesses and that's really what that's really what the future is about and that's so much of that now is about getting the right decisions made and for, you know we're about to hit the SEMA centenary SEMA was created 100 years ago by Unilever to give the board the information it needed to make the right decisions and that's never truer than it is today you know in 100 years that purpose is still there um, so people, yeah, you know, people ask me about, you know, does SEMA have a long term? Does, you know, does management accounting have a long term? Does our association have a long term? Too right, it does, because there's a burning, there's a burning need for, there's a burning need for what we do. It's in effect, it's helping make better decisions. It's um, and what what a business is looking for. Well, it's it's about value creation. It's creating customers and creating value for them. So yeah. as long as the decisions are directed at that, Andrew, then SEMA sh- and, and other associations should continue into the future, definitely. Yeah. And you, there's, a, there's a real driver here around you know, us creating the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants with, the, with AITPA. Doing that gave us a genuinely global organization. We can look at best practice across the world, you know, whether it's coming out of Western Europe, whether it's coming out of the United States, Canada, Australia, now China, India. And traditionally in our, in our world, the leading thinking, you know, where does it come from? Where do balance scorecards come from? Balance scorecards come from North America. Activity-based costing, what's that? That's an Anglo-American thing. You know, that was SEMA with Harvard University. Um, where's the next? Where's the next big innovation going to come from? Well, chances are, you know, in this world, it could well come out of China. It could well come out of India. We need to be, yeah, we need to be resourced. We need to be able to take that, take that genuinely, genuinely global view, so that we can best serve our members, best serve the profession, and best serve best serve business. Yeah, you know, we are ultimately about. Creating opportunities for people, creating creating prosperous careers, um, you know, prosperous prosperous businesses, and yeah, that 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 really drives drives a whole system. And you know, there are there are things there are things around there which the profession can can help with. You know, the moment we see a huge trust deficit. Um, okay, do you want to explain that a bit more? Trust deficit. I think I know what you mean, but but some of our audience may not grasp that fully. Yeah, let me let me let me think about. It. Yeah, that is that is in terms of you know what is what is trusted. You know, are politicians trusted? Is our businesses trusted? You know, our professions trusted? And we yeah you know, we kind of look at we look at that and we see you know we see trust levels across the world probably lower than lower than they have been in most of our most of our lifetimes um you know we have a little bit about you know what is what is true what is what is right what's wrong how do we how do we discriminate from that and yeah i think you know the accounting profession has 
long long been trusted i'm not going to i'm not going to deny there have been dips in that or deny that there have been challenges in that but yeah we have we have a role we have a role to play um and the way in which we as a professional body drive professionalism drive ethical values in our members you know we have a we have a role to play in in building that building that trust you know business says it wants to be trusted again business is only going to be trusted again if that's taken seriously in the boardrooms and in a boardroom you know what's taken seriously the things that are taken seriously are things that are measured things that appear on the board reports now you now what are management accountants been doing for the last 100 years we've been measuring more than the money yeah you know, we've been measuring productivity efficiency we've been you know, and we're now starting to measure outside outside influences that sort of thing so you know we need to start measuring we need to start measuring trust we need to start referring that in the metrics in the boardroom developing you know, everyone, oh you can't measure trust well perhaps there are surrogates that there that exist for measuring trust you know and those you know those start with those start with you know what do your customers think of you they start with what are the what are the communities your business operates in think of you and then that once you start looking at that then you start to get a focus on it again you know a key part of the management accountants world because that's a key part of how business values created nowadays Definitely. you know if we think about if we think about stakeholders think about stakeholder value you know it's it's no longer just that old concept of shareholder value that needs to be maximized there are other stakeholders who need to have their value maximized you know customers employees the communities they operate in the you know the governments of those countries which they operate in you know you see you see the current yeah the current discussion around you know businesses who report their profits in territories other than which they do their business you know, yeah. what, what's that all about that undermine that yeah, that really starts to undermine trust and confidence how Definitely. do we how do we deal with that how do we get a how do we get a line of sight into it um and it's all about it's all about getting the reporting right internally so so i i mean i think that's very fundamental i mean Maybe this has been too much focus on the companies in the past, but if you think about it, all businesses start because there's an unmet need in the community that the business or the company or the organization is looking to serve. So I suppose that's just, I think that's just good common sense that it's not just about the business anymore, it's about other stakeholders too. So Andrew, thanks for touching on the trust deficit and giving us some ideas on how to measure it. Now, you've been giving us great advice today, but I suppose maybe what's what's been the best bit of advice you've ever received? Oh, I... The best bit of advice that I've ever received was set ambitious targets and chase them down relentlessly. <laughs> um, and that was uh, that's certainly something which which helps to helps to energise a business. Um, particularly particularly if you're working in a business which is notionally not for profit, um, you know you need you need things to build momentum drive energy, drive enthusiasm. And that, that kind of thing, that kind of thing really does, really does, really does energize. I mean, I, that's short, short, snappy. It's a little bit glib. Um, <laughs> you know, if I'm, if I'm talking to someone about what would they, what would they like for their career advice? Um, you know, what I would say is, you know, look for opportunities, explore things that are interesting and focus on genuine impact. An impact is not about attention seeking. <laughs> yes, Ex I think uh, I think yeah, that can I sometimes be confused. Yes, yeah, of course, I completely. I'm not going to make any more comments. We ha we have many different generations listening into uh, into uh, into our podcast. So um, so yeah, I, I think I think ultimately it's about value creation is impact. Yeah, building those sustainable, profitable organizations, helping them make better decisions. If we're doing those things, that should be all things considered driving an impact. So. So Andrew, thank yeah. you for that. And I suppose, look, um, CMA, AICPA, fantastic resources you're, um, you're you're generating. But if there was one or two you'd recommend our audience check out, what might they be? Well, I'd suggest the audience today checks out our future finance reports. 
And those reports look at digitization. They look at the way in which professionals should be developing in the future. Um, they look at the shape of the finance function in the future. How's that, how's that going to look? You know, how does it move from the traditional pyramid or, or triangle shape? What does it move to change to? What does a network finance function look like? You know, a finance function out of the box, out of the, out of the back office. A finance function embedded across the business. So those, I think those are the, probably the, those are the, probably the things I would go to. I would absolutely go to first because that helps. That helps not only, not only individuals to shape shape their thinking, but it also helps and allows them to start to shape the thinking of the business that they're in, and shape the future Definitely. of their of their function within their role. Yeah. No, I, I, com I completely agree. It's, it's a start that that process is shaping. Uh, and I've read some of those reports. So I'll put those in the in the links in the show notes, and I highly recommend our audience check those out. And um, I suppose, uh, Andrew, you know, if people want to continue this conversation with you or, or reach out and try and connect with you, what's the best way to do that? At? Well, probably the best way to do it is through LinkedIn with you, with you, me, um, or through the or through the SEMA news channel on Twitter. Those kind of things are those kinds of things are always are always are, you know, they're always good channels to good channels to get to us through. I'm happy to talk to members, I'm happy to talk to people who are who are interested. If it's something I can't help them with directly, I can always point them towards someone who can. Brilliant. Andrew, thank you so much. And look, I just want to say say big thanks on behalf of our audience. Andrew, I know you're a very busy, busy person and, and with all the travelling and all you're doing for our profession. So really appreciate you taking the time to come on to our show. It's been great to talk with you, Andrew. I've really enjoyed it. And hope, hope, I hope we'll be able to do this again. So there you have it. Hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to know more about our guests today, their bio, and follow up on the resources mentioned during the show, you can find all the relevant links and more at sitnshow.com. There you'll also be able to get access to earlier shows, read the latest blogs. There's also an opportunity to subscribe to our newsletter which will give you heads up as to when the next show is coming out, latest events, news, and anything that's going to be relevant to help you have a fun, rewarding, and successful career in finance and accounting. And just before you go, we really appreciate your feedback. If there's something we can do better on the show, something that's not working, or something you'd like to see, even a guest you'd like for us to invite onto the show, someone who you think might be able to benefit you more and also the rest of our community, please let me know. You can email me. I'm at andrew at sitnshow.com or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Just drop me a message so I know how you found me and we can connect. And really, it's our community that will make the show. If we keep engaging and driving each other on, we'll keep on building our strength in the numbers. And when all is said and done, if we can do the numbers better and finance better, we'll create more opportunities for ourselves, our friends, our families, our communities and our businesses. So until next time, have a good rest of the week. Take care and let's keep building our strength in the numbers.